Krista Spain, an ICANN board member and a longtime figure in the country code top level domain sphere. Chris, in the early days, John Postel handled most CCTLD delegations directly. When ICANN was formed, the CC registers disputed a lot of the ICANN fees. There was a lot of contention. Tell us about that period. It's, it was wider than the fees, Brad. It was, it was the whole ICANN concept. CCTLDs are so, was a sovereign, still are. Um, and when I first came along to ICANN in uh, uh, 2000, November 2000, um, a lot of CCTLDs turned up to ICANN meetings to make sure nothing happened. Um, there was a, a, an argument going on about the, the, the legitimacy of ICANN, and more importantly, even if ICANN was legitimate, whether the CCTLD world should bother to be involved and, and should they pay them any money was of course a major part of that question, as well as um, should there be contracts between um, ICANN and the CCTLD manager. So for the first few years uh, from say 2000, the CCs would meet uh, uh, to talk about that and eventually in about 2002, um, enough people in the CCTLD world felt it was worth exploring having a uh, an inter a proper interface, a separate CCTLD interface with ICANN. Apart from the, originally the DNSO, the Domain Name Supporting Organization, mm -hmm. included CCs, um, but they left. Uh, and so the question was, should we have our own, our own organization? And as part of uh, the um, as part of a look, at, a look at ICANN structure, a review of ICANN structure, when we moved to what we have now, the supporting organization model, there was a call for there to be a CCNSO. And that then took quite some considerable time to corral enough, um, enough CCTLDs together to make it, to give it critical mass so that it was possible to negotiate the formation of the CCNSO. In those early days, yeah. is it an oversimplification to say that the CCs sort of didn't automatically assume ICANN authority? Um, well, they still don't. I mean, they, 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 they accept that ICANN has its role right. and that they have their role and CCs can choose to be, uh, there's no, because there's no contractual relationship, right. unlike in the GTLD world right. where every GTLD is in, is in a relationship with ICANN. In the CC world, with a few small exceptions, there is no contractual relationship. So what that means is that the CCs c come voluntarily to ICANN um, at, at its baseline, at its absolute baseline, all a CCTLD manager really cares about is the IANA function. And as long as the IANA function works, so a CCTLD manager can update uh, a phone number right. in the database or change an address, as long as that works and as long as it's stable, CCTLD managers at, a, at the base are happy. There's very little policy at a global level that has any effect on CCTLDs. One example is the interpretation of RFC 1591, which is the RFC that John Postel wrote mm -hmm. to govern the way that a CCTLD management could be transferred from one body to another. And CCs have completed now a, a policy development on, on how that should be interpreted. Now, the interesting thing to remember about that is that that is a global policy that tells ICANN what to do, mm -hmm. not a global policy that tells the CCTLDs what to do. And so this, this independence, uh, each one being sovereign, coming voluntarily, in my view, actually significantly contributes to the legitimacy of ICANN because you've got non-contracted people who run their own TLD turning up and involving themselves in the ICANN model. Not because model. they have to. Not because they have to, but because they choose to. So, yeah. Was there an assumption on the ICANN side of that equation in those very early days that the CCs would fall into line or...? or yes, absolutely. The, the ICANN, at that time, ICANN's, uh, I mean, ICANN was like a small number of people, so individuals' views um, you know, held, held sway and there was, a, for quite some time, there was a view that CCTLDs would sign contracts, that, that would happen, and CCTLDs would be obliged to make financial contributions. Um, and it just, it just didn't happen because it was never going to happen. I, I, I mean, getting the CCNSO fought in itself was, was we, we really got it across the line in Montreal in 2003 um, 
not because we had a lot of CCTLD managers willing to, to, to be in it, but more because the vocal voices against it just accepted that they wouldn't join, but they would not try it, they wouldn't block it. So, in other words, there was no active blocking by any CC? There point. was a little bit of active blocking, but then not enough to make it, yeah, very small number, and not enough to make it an issue. So when we set it up, the, 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 the bylaw said, uh, it doesn't officially become the CCNSO until you have four members in each of the regions. So mm -hmm. you've got Europe, Asia Pacific, Latin America, mm -hmm. and Caribbean, uh, and Africa. And you think about that for a second, you've got to get four members in each of those regions. Now the North American region is already a challenge because there aren't actually that many North American re members of the, of the North American region. And in fact, we're in Puerto Rico right now and Puerto Rico.pr was a founding member of the CCNSO. Um, in, in, uh, in Africa, we had uh, we didn't have an issue in Africa. We, we we got four members there. Asia Pacific was okay because we had Australia, and New Zealand, and uh, Taiwan, and and, uh, and one other which I can't remember. But Europe was a real challenge, a real challenge. Why? Because the the seat of the uh, the seat of the antipathy towards ICANN was based in Europe, and so you had um, large CCTLDs who simply wouldn't join. So the Netherlands was a, was a found, .nl was a founding member, um, and in the end we had to get uh, Gibraltar became a became a member, and we, we we couldn't find a fourth member. But because of the quirk of the ICANN regional setup that says that if you are a, if you are a, a protectorate, mm -hmm. you are part of that region. So the French Polynesian islands are actually part of Europe. We managed to persuade the Cayman Islands to join as a European oh, member wow. of the CCNSO. W was it naive in the early days on the part of ICANN to assume that the CCs would just fall in line with its authority? I, I'm not sure that it was an assumption that they would do that, and, and I don't think anyone was, was naive, but I do think that there was a, there was a, 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 real des a real need, I think, from the point of view of, of legitimacy of making ICANN uh, legitimate in this area to, to be able to show that you brought the CCTLDs along. I mean, it's the same thing in respect to governments. If you hadn't got the governments in, right. then how can you say that you have a, 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 you ha you have a multi-stakeholder model? You just can't. You've, what you've got is a trade organization for GTLDs. So there wasn't, I don't think, it wasn't like, I don't think there was a sort of like, it, it was really just like, we have to have this, and this is how we're going to get it. And over time, that, we, we kind of wore, <laughs> we wore it down to a point where people went, okay, well, we'll accept this. And, and I think that's worked pretty well, really. You wore it down how? Oh, just, well, well, in various different ways, by those of us who were sort of committed to the multi-stakeholder model and wanted this to work by, by tempering the, the agitation from the ones on the, on the other end of the poll who just said, not interested, never do it. We kind of brought the parties together. Mm -hmm. I mean, Montreal was, we spent, I spent Bart Boswinkle from .nl, Bernie Turkett from .ca and me, and Alejandro Pisanti and Hans uh, from Netherlands on the board spent five days in a basement in Montreal, in the Sheraton Hotel in Montreal, nutting out the final bits oh, of, the CC, of the CCNSO. And, and this was what time frame again? What, 2003, what? Montreal. And then what had happened was that the, the deal had to go to the GAC, to the Governmental Advisory Committee, to be, yes, tick endorsed, and had to go to the CCTLD room and, had, and have enough um, buy-in from the CCTLD managers in that room for us to be able to say, we are now going to push the button and see if we can find the four members from each region. And during that time, that afternoon, there were, were of three or four hours, the GAC chair was Cheryl Tamizi, and he was obviously chairing the GAC. Mm. And I was the, the sort of the, 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 the nominated um, the negotiator, if you like, in the CCTLD room. And Cheryl was explaining to the GAC how this was all going to work and they should endorse it. And I was explaining to the CCTLDs how it's going to work. And a number of CCTLD managers, even at that late stage, were running between the two rooms telling the GAC that it wasn't going well in the CCTLD room and telling the CCTLD room it wasn't going well in the GAC. Fortunately, Cheryl and I were on um, 
messenger with each other. Messenger, remember that? Um, it shows you how long ago it was, right? And, um, and so we were able to make sure that, that, that nothing, nothing went wrong. But it was touch and go. And, uh, that was obviously a critical moment. Oh, yeah. What were some of the others? Oh, IDNs. I mean, IDNs was, was it's the thing that I'm probably the proudest of that the CCs did, the, fast, the IDN fast track. Because of the expansion of inclusivity? Yes. I mean, what happened was that we were at an, an, an APTLD, Asia Pacific TLD meeting in, in Dubai uh, in 2007, I think. And Teresa Swinehart from ICANN, Yanis Karklins, who was then the chair of the GAC, and I were at this meeting and we were in a session. And the, the wave of passion that came out of that room, it's the first time we'd had a meeting in the, Asia, in, in the Arab region, in mm -hmm. the Asia Pacific thing. The wave of passion that came out of that room to say, we, this is ridiculous, we cannot use the internet properly because we cannot type in our script, was so amazing that at the coffee break, Yanis, Teresa and I went, stood in a, at a table in the hallway with, with, a, with literally an envelope and a pen and, and, and wrote down how could we make this work so that it happened quickly, knowing that a full-blown policy development process would take a considerable amount of time. Sure. And from there we developed the, the concept of having the fast track. The fast track was the first time in, in ICANN where the GAC had been prepared to actually um, nominate people from the GAC to actually be on a working group. The GAC's way of working previously had been, we don't do that, we're all in it together and you just tell us what you're doing and then we'll sort it out later. But they actually agreed to put individual people on the working group we had at large. So it was actually the first cross-community working group in ICANN, although we didn't call it that then. And that worked to build the fast track and to make that work so that IDNs were able to be, to be launched. Now I have a terrible memory for dates and times and I cannot remember the date it was, but I do remember it was in Seoul. And I was, the, I was chairing the CCNSO. Peter Dan Gates Rush was the chair of the board. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, Avery was, G I don't remember, but I think it was Avery was GNSO chair. And the board passed the resolution to launch the IDN fast track and everyone in that room was in tears because it meant so much. It was an extraordinary moment. There is, to the layperson, to the ICANN world, hmm. there is, I think, not clarity in terms of the relationship between CCs and the respective governments. Yeah, well, that's, that varies from CC to CC, right. right? So you have some CCs who are our government. They are, they are just pe they're people nominated by the government. And, and, you know, China is an obvious example right. of that. Um, there are some CCs that are entirely, entirely independent of government. Um, now, most of those are, um, are legacy ones that where you've got still got an individual who's running that CCTLD right. who John Postel nominated. Not all, but most. Uh, and they are, they might talk to their government, but they're entirely independent of them. You have some that are academia, universities running them. Because a lot of John's nominations were you know, obviously right. clearly in the universities, yeah. And then, and then you have the ones that have the sort of middle ground model, which is usually a sort of membership-based independent organisation that has a good, either a liaison role, government either has a liaison role or in some cases an oversight role mm -hmm. in respect to that organisation. So it, the, the relationship varies, but if you want to run a successful CCTLD, you pretty much need to have a good relationship with your government. So in that context, Chris, was there concern on the part of many governments about this involvement in ICANN in those early days? Well, again, I think it varies from government to government. I mean, there are some, in those days, there were some CCTLDs who, who wanted who didn't want there to be anything too loud mm -hmm. or, or too far above the parapet because their concern was if government actually wakes up to us, then we're going we're gonna to have a problem. Um, then there were some who were, you know, who were government and so on. I think it was a mixed bag. I think in the same way that the, the, the CCTLD managers, some were for can, some were didn't care, some were against, whatever. The same thing applies to governments, and it still does. I mean, there are still, you know, there are governments in the, today that, you know, f don't feel comfortable with the ICANN model, and there are go governments that do. In this project, we're obviously looking back in yes. time. But looking ahead for a moment, is it now just an automatic given 
that CCs are, are within the ICANN sphere, with it, a part of the ICANN process, a part of the ICANN community? Well, again, I suppose it depends on what you mean. I mean, if you mean, is it a given that, that they will... Speak in terms of involvement. I mean, in terms of involvement, no, it's not a given. I mean, a lot of CCTLDs do come. A lot, uh, so, uh, quite a significant number do come. And I mean, in, the, in respect to the CCNSO, we've probably reached the, the sort of 80-20 point. Mm -hmm. where, you know, the, the getting the last bunch of members is ha much, much harder than, sure. you know, it's changing. Because of the break now of the line between CCTLDs and GTLDs, because you've got CCTLD managers running GTLDs now, uh, because of the new GTLDs, mm -hmm. and you've got, you've got um, geographic names appearing in the GTLD world, I think that's making, bringing the two sides, if I can use that word, together. Um, stress is what holds buildings up. And the stress between those two organizers, the GNSO and the CCNSO, is actually quite important because it's, 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 it binds ICANN together. And the more the CCTLD community kind of needs to involve itself in what's going on in the GNSO mm -hmm. world, whether it's from a protectionist point of view or from a I'm involved point of view, the more we actually come together as a community. Now, it doesn't mean we, get, we necessarily agree with each other, but at least we're in the same room discussing it. So in the future, I think, Right now, I think it is changing, and there's much more cross-community stuff than there used to be. The silos are kind of breaking down. You, you made a point of mentioning, and I think it's an interesting point, that CC involvement was a form of validation of the ICANN model. It, it, it contributes to the legitimacy, absolutely, yes. Did ICANN see it that way in the early days? I, I think some people certainly did. I mean, some people... I think some people just felt that they had to get the CCTLDs involved because there were, uh, you know, 246 of them and they'd all pay money. So that was good because yeah. there wasn't a lot of money, sure. right? Um, but I think that the, uh, on, uh, others were, were clearly felt and, and uh, that the CCTLDs were critical from the point of view of, of building the base of defensibility of the, of the ICANN model. Um, mm -hmm. Otherwise, uh, you can't really say you, you, you're doing what you do because you haven't got a, a, a significant portion of the... CC of the of the DNS uh, in your on your on your side, Chris. Was there ever a concern, either in the early days or right up to present, that on the part of the CC operators and part of the CC community, that they were taking second uh, second seat to the the generic? Uh, no, the they wanted to take second seat because that what they did, they didn't want ICANN to be um, to be influential. In the, in the CC world. They wanted ICANN to concentrate on the GTLD world. Uh, and so basically the CCs... In the early days? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The CCs were basically quite happy to have their own room. And I mean, there was talk at the time of, you know, we'll pay, we'll pay for our own room. Yeah. And we shouldn't take the money from ICANN. And if you go, if you go back and look at the bylaws, uh, when, we, when we set up the CCNSO, it was critical. And this took a long time to get agreed. It was critical that we, the CCs actually have the right to decide who their staff support is. And if the CCs are not happy with that, they have the right to say, thanks, we'll create our own and we'll pay for it. And that was a really important point because people said, well, we can't, if, if, if we're having to, if I can, staff are going to be providing us with all of this stuff, well, the, 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 clearly we'll get captured. I mean, it hasn't happened, of course, but then, you know, we've got Bart Boswinkle, so. You expressed a great deal of pride. In fact, you wore the pride on your face when you were talking about IDNs. Yeah. No one's been more involved in the development of CCs and bringing them within mm. the ICANN world mm. than probably you have. What other points of pride do you have? Well, I'm going to answer that before I do. I think I, I must acknowledge uh, the, the work of, that Leslie Cowley did when she took over from me as chair of the CCNSO because what she did was work really hard to, to, inc to, to increase the membership. So she, you know, I, I, that really does need to be acknowledged. Um, I think probably the th setting it up, I, I mean, there are lessons to be learned in what everyone, in all sorts of ways, what everybody does. I mean, I think, for example, one of the things that the CCs did was when we set ourselves up, we got our four members in, e in each region, and the first thing we did was a review of ourselves because we thought, well, this is, we've now, we're now here, we exist. Now we need to find out what we need to change in order for other people who haven't joined to, to, to join. Mm -hmm. And that first step was actually uh, uh, um, broke down a lot of barriers because people went, oh, okay, so you're not just going to 
close the doors and carry on. But I think, I mean, in general terms, Brad, I, 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 I'm just, I just think this model is so, is, is so interesting. It's extremely hard work, um, but it's so interesting and so, and so important as a model that, that um, for me, ha having CCs actually agree to be part of it is the most important thing. I mean, how can you, I used to say this to people, how can you at, your, in, at home claim your right to run an independent CCTLD where you're not run by your government, you've got a membership-based organisation and you run it and you say you do outreach. How can you do that at home and claim the right to do that and then not support the equivalent model internationally? It just doesn't make sense. Otherwise, you know, it's your legitimacy that's on the what line. What came back at you when you argued that? Oh, well, it's nothing to do with that. It's not, it's not you, it's them. You know, it's all of that stuff, all the stuff about, well, it's not that, it's about, will I, is joining ICANN, uh, sorry, is joining the CCNSO putting me in a contractual relationship with ICANN? No. Well, prove it to me. I mean, yeah. we had to have a lot of that kind of, I make this claim, and until you prove to me that I'm wrong, I'm not going to do anything. So the response of, well, no, actually, you have to show me that your claim is right. They wanted a proof Doesn't of a negative. Work. A proof of a negative, exactly. But I think, you know, that was a long time ago, and we have a very vibrant CCTLD community, and a lot of people who were, you know, very anti have now turned around and, 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 and are part of it. And that's definitely something that I think we should all all be proud of. I think I think ICANN should be proud of, of its relationship with the CCTLD community. I think the CCTLDs uh, generally are pretty proud of what they do and, and that's great. It's a fascinating history. Chris Spain, thank you very much. Thank you.